Welcome to chapter 9. Here we're going to do some calculations based on some of the chemical equations we've talked about earlier and how to balance them. Uh, we're in introduction to stoichiometry. Uh, we're talking about the mole to mole calculations, uh, the mole to mass calculations, uh, mass to mass, which is basically mass to moles, moles to moles, moles to mass, so several steps there, and then limiting reactions. So here we talk about molar mass. We've talked about that before, what a mole is. We have the mole being the 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of something, in this case molecules, formula units, uh, atoms, uh, ions. So another word for formula units would be molecules um, or compounds. So those, those are kind of the generic term for a collection thing uh, in chemistry. Um, so what's the molar mass then of this aluminum compound? We have one aluminum, three chlorines, nine oxygens. Multiply those out add them up and you get 277.33 grams per mole. So one mole of that compound weighs 277.3 grams. So then you can use that in calculations. So what happens if you have two moles of that compound? The planning process then goes into saying, well, what do you know? In this case, we know we have 2.5 moles. So we know we know we need to come up with a number of grams. So that's our plan, is to go from moles to grams. So when we do that, then we can calculate that out. We start with the number of moles. We use that conversion process, because we know the amount, the grams per mole. Then that gives us the overall grams, and we're done. How many grams do we have? based on that number. And that looks about right because we want to just slightly more than double. So 277 doubled is going to be that 2 is 4, you know, 600 or so up to almost 700. So that, in general, that answer makes sense. So now we're going to do moles to grams. So how, we're going to then calculate the number of moles from the number of grams. So our plan then is grams to moles. That's our plan, because we're given a certain amount of grams, and then we're going to calculate a certain amount of moles from that. So that's, our end, that's our end game for this particular calculation. So that's our plan from grams to moles. Use that conversion process. We're then going to calculate that process. We have the grams to start out with, and we're going to then divide that uh, by the moles. So we're converting from grams to moles. Those cancel. And then we're given that number of moles, 1.27 times 10 to the minus 2 moles from that amount. So we know that that's not a lot. It's a very small amount, that 3 grams. So now we're going to calculate the formula units contained in 12 grams. So our plan is to go from grams to formula units or molecules. So that's the plan. So here we're going to go from grams to formula units or molecules. We know that one mole is the 277.33 grams, and that is that 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd formula units or molecules. So let's calculate that. We have the 12.4 grams going to convert that from the grams to the formula units or from to the molecules. So therefore, that 12 grams uh, gets multiplied by the 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, then divided by 277.33 to give you the 2.69 times 10 to the 22nd formula units. All right, let's take a look then at calcium chloride. So what we're going to do then is then add up and determine the atomic mass, the molecular weight, sorry, the molecular weight of calcium chloride. So we add that up. We have the 111.53 grams per mole. So then we then know where our plan is going to be to go from moles to grams. So we start out with our moles. And then how many we know we have 3.61 moles. 
We're then going to use our conversion process we just calculated to know that we have in one mole 110.53 grams. Both cancel. Grams are left over. So then 3 times 100, 3.6 times 100 gives you approximately 400. So it should be 401 as our final answer with significant figures. So 401 is our final answer. How many moles of hydrochloric acid are contained in 18.2 grams? Once again, our plan is to go from grams to moles. So our first step then is to determine how much we have in one mole. So then we do the molecular weight. We have the uh, 36.46 grams per mole and those together. So then we take our 18 grams and then divide that by the grams per mole for the 36. So the 18 divided into that 36 is half for the number of moles. So 18 grams is a half a mole. Because 36 grams is a mole. What's the mass of 1.6 times 10 to the 23rd molecules? So the plan is to go from formula units or molecules to grams. So that's the plan. Going from molecules to grams. So our first step in the process then is to know we have, we're starting out with 1.6 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of hydrochloric acid. We know we have the conversion factor of one mole equaling 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. So then we know then we can then calculate the weight, which is going to be 36.46 for hydrochloric acid. So then we can determine the number of grams from that. So when a conversion factor happens, then we have that 1.6 times 10 to the 23rd. We know that we have, and that is molecules. So then we know that we have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules in one mole. We know that one mole weighs 36.46 grams. So molecules cancel, moles cancel, and we're left with grams. So 1.6 times 10 to the 23rd times 36.46 divided by 6.02 gives you then the answer which is 9.69. So stoichiometry deals with the quantitative relationships between these reactants and products once you balance the reaction. So when you say what is the mole ratio, that mole ratio is the ratio of one of these things to the other. So when we look at that mole ratio, we're saying that one mole Remember, if it's not written, it's a 1. So 1 mole of nitrogen gas plus 3 moles of iodine gas gives you 2 moles of uh, nitrogen iodide. And so that mole ratio then is the, is the combination of those, is the ratio of that. So you have a 3 to 1 ratio of the I to the N. So when you look at the I to the N, you have a 3 to 1 ratio here. 3 to 1. When you're then comparing the products to the reactants, when you're comparing the iodine to what's made, 
you have the iodine compared to the nitrogen iodine, iodide. So you have that ratio there of a 3 to 2 ratio. For every 3 moles of iodine that you use, you produce 2 moles of the product. And then lastly, we have the other product, or the other reactant. We have nitrogen compared to our final product. And what's the relationship there? Well, we have 1 compared to 2. For every 1 mole of nitrogen that we use, we produce 2 moles of the nitrogen iodine. So those are the ratios of those particular reactions. Okay, which of these statements is not correct about this reaction? So we look at this, one mole of nitrogen is needed for every three moles of iodine. So one, that's a one to three uh, ratio. Is that the current ratio here? Nitrogen and iodine is one to three, so that's correct. One gram of nitrogen is needed for every three grams of iodine. No, we don't know that. All this talks about is the fact that we have a mole relationship. We don't know anything about grams yet, so that's not correct. We haven't done any calculations to determine grams yet. So now we're going to calculate uh, the number of moles using that relationship. So if we have 5.5 uh, moles of nitrogen, then what happens then to the reaction? So we then have a plan. We're going to go from moles of nitrogen gas to the moles of the nitrogen uh, oxide solid. <clears throat> so then this is how you set it up. We have our moles of our, we have our ratio. The moles of what we're doing, the desired substance, from the moles of the starting thing. So we're going from to. So our from and our to. This is our from divided by our to on the top. So we're going from nitrogen to that. So the Nitrogen goes on the bottom for that ratio. So then to calculate that, then we take that 5 moles of our N2 times that relationship. And then, then, then we know the number of moles of the final product. So it's a 2 to 1 ratio. So we double the number of moles of N2 and we get the number of moles of Ni3 coming out. So let's calculate then the number of moles of I2 needed to react with uh, the 5.5 grams of N2. So here's our plan. We have going from, in this case we want to say when we have these two things to react together, or it's our relationship between these two things that are reacting together. So then we're going from, we're basically taking the relationship between the nitrogen and the iodine to determine then how much we're going to need. So that relationship is a 1, 2, 3 relationship. So then we do the setup. Then that tells us then, once again, we're going from nitrogen to iodine. So we have the from, from to. So here's our from. Here's our two. So when we do that calculation, we know we have how much I, how much nitrogen we have to start out with. We know the ratio. Cross it, then the nitrogen crosses out, and then we have a, a three to one ratio. So basically, we have three times as much that we need of iodine. So that makes sense. If we have a one to three ratio, we need to have three times as much iodine to make the reaction go. So how many moles of HF are need to be produced by the complete reaction of 1.4 moles of H? So 
then we have the ratios. Okay, we're looking to, to go from our H2, so we're going from our H2 to our HF. So that ratio is a 1 to 2 ratio. So you're doubling the amount, so then you have the 2.14. Stoichiometry then, the problem solving strategy for stoichiometry, then is to basically convert the substance to moles. So the first step is to go to moles, then convert moles of the starting substance to moles of the desired substance, the from to the to. Convert the moles of the desired substance to the units specified in the problem. Moles to moles, it's that one step. If we're doing the grams or something else, then you'd add more steps to make that last conversion process. So here then is our kind of our, our flow chart. If we have a mole to mole conversion, then basically it's just that one step using the ratio, moles to moles. If instead we start out with grams, we know how much of something there is, then we have those two steps in the process, grams to moles, moles to moles, those two steps in the process. If we're going to do the complicated part and go all three steps, then we have grams to moles, moles to moles, and then moles to grams. So we have that three steps in that process. You can't shortcut that. You always have to go through each individual step when making those calculations. So here's a mole to mole calculation. How many moles of aluminum are needed to make the 0 0.0935 moles of H2? So then we have the ratios from the balanced equation. So this is where we're building on that process. I could give you these not balanced and ask you to balance these and then ask you the second process. That will happen. So the plan is to go from our given amount of H2, what are we going to make from a certain amount of aluminum? So we're starting with how much aluminum to make a certain amount, in this case the 0 0.0935 moles of hydrogen. So then we look at the ratio. What's the ratio of aluminum to hydrogen? So we have that 2 to 3 ratio. So then we can set up the calculation. We have the amount known from the number of moles of hydrogen gas. We then use that ratio that 2 to 3 ratio crowds at the number of moles of hydrogen, then we know that we're given then how much aluminum after that. So that's that basically that one step, the mole to mole conversion, given that ratio from the balanced equations. Another example. So in this case we're going to go from our hydrochloric acid to hydrogen gas. How much hydrochloric acid do we need to make that many moles of hydrogen gas? We have our ratio, our three, 6 to 3 ratio. And we can then set up and do that calculation based on that ratio. So we know how much hydrogen gas we have. We then know that reaction, that conversion process. Then we can then determine with that 6 to 3 ratio which basically is a 2 to 1 ratio, then we know we need twice as much to do that particular calculation. So how many moles of H2 are made from the reaction of the 1.5 moles with as much aluminum as we need? 
So in this case, we're going to go from our HCl over to a hydrogen gas. So how many moles of that given in a certain amount of this? So if we have 1.5 moles of, hydro of hydrochloric acid, how much hydrogen are we going to make? So then we need that, that relationship, that mole to mole ratio of 6 to 3 or 2 to 1, that ratio. So we can solve, given that ratio, of 0.75, because you have the 1 mole times that ratio. So if I have the 1.5 moles of HCl, I have HCl, and then I want to know then my ending amount of hydrogen gas. I then can use the ratios of the three hydrogen gases to the six HCl's. These are then going to cancel. So 1.5 times 3 divided by 6 is my answer. How many moles of carbon dioxide are produced when three moles of oxygen react in the following reactions? So once again, we're going to start with our oxygen. And we have three moles of this. We want to know how much carbon dioxide is made. How much are we going to make? So if we have those three moles of oxygen, we know the ratio. For every five moles of oxygen, we make three moles of carbon dioxide. So three times three divided by five. Nine divided by five is probably that. How many moles of the C3H8 are consumed when we have that many molecules? Okay, so now this is not a mole to mole conversion. Okay, we now have molecules involved. So then we have to plan this. We want to go from moles of one thing to moles of another, then to molecules. We have, two, we have those two steps involved now, instead of just the one step. So we're going to go from how many moles are consumed. So we have how many moles are consumed when we make carbon dioxide. So we can do the first step of moles to moles, and then the second step then of moles to molecules. So then uh, we know then that... Uh, we have the 1.81 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. Of CO2. So then what's the rate? Well, then we know then we need to convert then to moles. So we have 6.8. 02 times 10 to the 23rd number of molecules in one mole of carbon dioxide. And then we can use the mole ratio of carbon dioxide. So we know that we have for every uh, three moles of carbon dioxide, we need one mole of this C3H8. So then we're left with moles. So molecules cancel. Moles cancel. And then we're left with that. So one 
6.18 times 1 times 1 divided by the uh, 6.02 uh, times the 3. And that's going to come point one. <clears throat> All right. So we have uh, how many, what's the mass of H2 is made by reacting three moles of hydrochloric acid with excess aluminum. So once again, we're going to go from We have three moles, so we're going from moles of one thing to moles of another, in this case moles of HCl, to moles of H2, HCl, H2, and then when we're done, we want grams. So that's the plan. So we're then we're going to go from... hydrochloric acid to hydrogen gas. We know we have three moles of this. How many grams are left over? How many grams do we make when we do that? So that's that two-step process. So that's our plan. Moles to moles, moles to grams. So we're going to calculate that. We have the three moles. We have our first conversion process <coughs> from our balanced equation. Then we can go through the second step in the process and then convert the moles over to grams using the molecular weight. So our end answer then is three grams. So you can see how a lot of the things we've done so far have built into this particular problem. How to, how to calculate, how to create, how to come up with the molecular mass. If I didn't give you that, you should be able to calculate that from the periodic table. How to do balanced equations, how to create those compounds. If I only gave you these two, you should be able to create those two compounds from that. And then to go through and calculate um, the mole conversion and the mass conversion. So it all builds on one another. All right. So you look at a moles to mass calculation. So these are the places where then you start out the number of moles and you're going to calculate a mass after that. So given this particular equation, um, when you're going to calculate that moles to mass process, you have the plan. So you have the two grams of aluminum, which we know the molecular weight is listed there. Convert that to moles of aluminum. Convert that to moles of hydrochloric acid. That's the plan. That's our two-step process. Grams to moles, moles to moles. Now we're going to calculate that. Take our grams. Convert that by the molecular weight we're given. That gives us a number of moles. And we can use their balanced equation to then convert those numbers of moles of aluminum with that ratio, stoichiometric ratio, to create the number of moles of hydrochloric acid. Grams to moles, moles to moles. Let's take a look at the mass of this aluminum compound. It needs to react with 0 0.093 moles of the Na2Cl3. So when we have that particular equation, that balanced equation, we have the plan. Going from moles of the sodium compound to moles of the aluminum compound to grams of that. So moles to moles, moles to grams. Now we're going to calculate that. We have the number of moles we're given. We do the first conversion using that balanced equation gives us the number of moles of that compound. Now we're going to do the separate, the set next step was then, is now to go from those moles to the amount based on the molecular, for, molecular mass. So then we know how many grams of that compound. Moles to moles, 
moles to grams in that calculation. So now how many moles of this aluminum compound are made by reacting the 3.45 grams of the sodium compound with as much of that aluminum compound as we need. So once again, our plan is to go from the grams of the sodium compound, sodium carbonate, to the moles of sodium carbonate, to the grams of the aluminum carbonate. So then when we calculate that, we have the starting amount, how many grams that we had when we started. Use that conversion process. We, we can calculate the molecular weight of that sodium, sodium carbonate. Then that gives us the number of moles of sodium carbonate. Now we take the second step in the process. Take those number of moles of sodium carbonate and then calculate then from that mole ratio that we got from our balanced equation how many moles of the ending sodium carbonate pro product uh, that it took, actually sodium carbonate reactant that it took to make that thing happen. And so once again, we have the overall process of grams to moles, moles to moles, when we're all done. So that's the plan. So how many moles of oxygen are consumed when 36 grams of our aluminum oxide are produced? So if I didn't give you this balanced reaction, you should be able to determine that. So if you go through and say, okay, well, if I start with aluminum oxide, how would I create this balanced reaction? So I know that I have oxygen is then reacting with aluminum. I should be able to know that O2 is the gas. Aluminum is going to be the solid. I know that when I create this particular compound, aluminum oxide, I know aluminum is going to be that plus three. Uh, that oxygen is going to be the minus two. So then I need to know then I have the plus six and minus six. I should be able to make that compound. And when I make the compound, you should be able to balance the reaction. So then when you have two here to start out with, you can put a two here to begin with. You know that you have three here, you know you have three, two here, so then you have the whole three halves thing, multiply everything by two, and you end up with four, three, one of these is then two. So that gives you then the, the balanced reaction. So if I don't give you this, you should be able to do that, because you'll have to. So now that I have that, then I then can go in and, and, and determine what my plan is going to be. So I have a number of grams. Grams to moles. And then probably moles to moles when all is said and done because we have any moles of something else. So we have grams of aluminum oxide to the moles of aluminum oxide to moles of oxygen. So that's our plan. Grams to moles, moles to moles. Now the molecular weight is 101.96. Then we can use that molecular weight to go through that process then. We start out with a 38.0 grams of the aluminum oxide. Then we know then how many grams is in one mole. 101.96. Grams in one mole, and then we know then from the ratio of the balanced equation of the Al2O3, we know that two Al2O3 
is there for every three oxygens. So grams and grams, moles and moles, and we're left with moles of oxygen at the very end. So 38 times 2 divided by uh, 101.96 times 2. And then that will then give you that answer. All right. So what mass of hydrochloric acid is produced when you have 1.82 uh, times 10 to 24th molecules of oxygen to form that reaction? So what's the plan? We start out with molecules. So we have molecules of H2. We're going to end up going to moles of H2. And then we're going to go to moles of hydrochloric acid. And then we want a mass when we're all done. So then we want grams of hydrochloric acid. So we have a couple steps involved here. So we have that 1.81. Let me put this down a little bit so I don't run into the thing over there. 1.81 times 10 to the 24th molecules. Point oh two times ten to the twenty fourth molecules and one mole of H two. So then we can use the balanced equation to get us to uh, HCl. So for every one. H2, we get two HCLs. And then our last step then is to go from moles of HCL to grams of HCL. So we have 36.46 grams HCL. So Molecules to molecules, moles to moles, moles to grams. So 1.8 times 2 times 36.4 divided by the 6.02 times 1 times 1. Gets you 219 grams. So when we have this equation, we have one mole of the Ca3P2, giving you the two moles of pH3. The other possibility is the one gram equals one gram. Three moles are made from that. And two moles are made from that. So which of the following is going to be correct? So when we look, take a look at that, we know that one mole to two, so we're looking at this compared to this, and that in, indeed is a one to two ratio. So that's correct. One gram to two grams, we don't know that. So we have to go through and calculate that, that that's true. Uh, I can almost guarantee it's not. Uh, three moles are made from each of the two moles of this. So we take a look at the CaO. Let me compare that to the pH 3. We have a 
3 to 2 ratio there. So that is correct. The mole ratio of pH 3, pH 3, comparing that to C3, P2, for every two moles, we get one mole. That's correct. So from the balance equation, all we can do is moles. Can't do grams. Let's so we'll work through that actual process of calculating each one of those. Here we're looking at this compared to this and that gives us then that. So our ratio is 1 to 6 and that gives us 2. So if we change that ratio to 2 then this ratio is going to increase. If it's a 1 to 6 ratio when we do 2, then this is going to change to 12, and then that is going to change to 4. So this is not correct, because this is not correct in that particular ratio. Take a look at two moles. So we have the that compared to this compared to this. So let me write down our ratio. We currently have a 1 to 6 to 3 ratio. So if we're going to double this, two moles, then the six is going to go to twelve moles, and the three is going to go to six moles. So this is also not correct, because this fifteen is not valid. And then these down here, we have to go in and calculate the number of grams for each of those. So I'll let you do that. I'm not going to take time to do that at this particular point. You have to do the grams. The plan would be grams to moles for this particular, and then grams to moles for that one. That will tell you how many moles there is. And you can see then if that is a comparable. When you do this, you can determine if C32PO is the limiting reactant. So if you convert those over from moles to moles, then you can see what the mole ratio is between them. And if the mole ratio happens to be when you add 200 grams to 100 grams, if that mole, if that mole ratio is a 1 to 6 ratio, then you know that they're the same. If you end up having more, uh, if you end up having water left over, then sure enough, this then is the limiting reagent. So if you have excess water, if you have more than six moles in comparison, then that would be then true. So that's when you have then this particular uh, graphic to then show you then um, all of those parts put together when we go from grams to moles, moles to moles, and then moles to grams. Those steps in that process. You can't skip any. We have to go each step. Grams to moles, 
moles to moles, and then moles to grams. So what mass of bromine, which is at 59.8 grams per mole, is needed to completely consume aluminum? So you have the balanced equation. You know that you have 7 grams going to moles of aluminum, going to moles of bromine, going to grams of bromine. Don't forget, bromine is diatomic. If you do BR there, it won't work out correctly. Do BR2. So here's that calculation. We have our plan. Now we need to calculate it. So we then do our first step to go from grams to moles of aluminum. Then our second step to go from moles to moles with the balanced equation. Then our third step is to go from moles then back to grams. So our final answer then is 62.2 grams of bromine. So here's a math to math calculation. So our plan is to go from grams of FeCl3 to moles of FeCl3 to moles of Fe2S3 then to grams of Fe2S3. So we can calculate. We do our first step, grams, two moles, using the balanced equation, moles to moles. No, I'm sorry. We did, we did grams to moles based on the molecular weight. Now we're doing moles to moles based on the balanced equation. And then we use then moles to grams based on the molecular weight of that particular compound. We come up with that answer of 5.99 grams. So that's our process. Grams to moles. Grams to moles. Moles to moles. Moles to grams. Those are our three steps. All right, so how many, what's the mass of oxygen that consumed uh, when 54 grams of water is produced? So our plan is to go from grams of water to moles of water to moles of oxygen to grams of oxygen. So if we start out with the 54 grams of water. We then know that in every single grams water, moles water, we know that um, water weighs 18.2. Yep, 18.02, so 
grams to moles. Ballast equation to go from moles of water. So for every two moles of water, we want to go to oxygen. So we have one oxygen. So and we want to go from moles of oxygen to grams of oxygen. So in one mole of oxygen, we have 30, no oxygen is yet two. We have 632 grams of oxygen. So 54 times 32 divided by 18 times 2. So That's our plan. We talked about that. So 37.8. The mass of water produced when 12 grams of hydrochloric acid reacts with uh, iron oxide. So our plan is to go from grams of hydrochloric acid to moles hydrochloric acid to moles water to grams water so we have our 12 grams of hydrochloric acid So then for every let's see 36, so now we then and one mole of HCl, we have 36.46 grams HCl. We're then going over to water. So for every one uh, for hydrochloric acid, which is six and then we know we make three waters and then we want to have then in one mole of water how many grams so H2O is the 18.02 grams of water so HCl, moles of HCl, moles of water, grams of water. So 12 times 3 times 18 divided by 36 times 6. Two point nine seven. Okay, limiting reagents. So when you have a reaction occur, there's usually something that determines how much you'll make. So when you look at these reactions here, if this was water, for example, and we had two hydrogens plus the one oxygen giving us H2O, but would limit this. So for every one of those light blue balls, we have to have two of the dark ones. So then if we draw those, see that these two match with this one. These two match with that one. These two match with that one, these two this one, these two that one, these two this one, these two this one, and these two go to that one. 
So when the dark blues are all used up, we have access, we have extra of these. They're left over. So our limiting reagent is the thing that gets used up first. So the dark blues are the limiting reagent. So that shows you a little animation of what I draw with of what I drew with two left over. So the limiting reagent is the thing that limits what can be produced. The reaction stops and the limiting reagent is used up. So in our example, the small blue balls are the limiting reagent. When they're used up, the reaction stops. We have excess large light blue balls. So the excess reactant is the thing that has leftovers when you're all done. In this case, it's the larger blue ball. So we have extra of. And here's another example. When you're going to take bike parts and make bikes out of them, you need a certain ratio of bike parts. So every bike needs a certain amount of information, needs a certain products to go together. So in this case, to make a bike, we need to have a frame, one frame. We need to have two wheels, and we need to have one pedal assembly. So our ratio is a one to two to one ratio. So then if we match them up, we can say that these two wheels go to that frame, these two wheels Go to that frame. These two wheels go to this frame. And those two wheels go to that frame. So without taking into account the pedals yet, we would use everything up. Okay? But now we have to count in the pedals too. So when we look at the pedals as well, we can take those pedals and then we, how we can only make three bikes though. Because we have one pedal going to this bike, one pedal to that bike, and then one pedal to this bike. So the pedals are the limiting reagent. Because there's not enough pedals to make the last bike. So then we have leftovers. We have an almost bike, but not enough pedals. So the pedals then become the limiting reagents. Because you can only, since you only have three of them, you can only make three bikes. So the techniques for solving a limiting reagent problem is to convert one to the moles or mass of the product, convert reactant number two to moles or mass of product, and then compare the answers. The smaller one gives you the maximum yield. We only had three pedals, therefore we can only make three bikes. That was the smallest number of things of all those parts in that ratio. So here's a chemical example. We're going to calculate the number of moles of water that can be made by reacting the 1.5 moles with a number of grams, number of moles of oxygen. So then we have the parts here. We then need to go through and say, well, what is if we have uh, 1.5 moles of H2 and we have then 0.932 moles of O2, what are we going to make? What's the limiting reagent? Well, we know we have a 1 to 2 ratio. So then we need to determine then when we have 
determine what that ratio is compared to those things. So if we have 0.92 moles of gas, of oxygen, how does that relate to the, with that 1 to 2 ratio? If we have 1.5 moles of H2 gas, how does that relate? So let's take a look at that. So first of all, you calculate the theoretical yield. And you calculate how much water you're going to make from the O2 if, X, if, if hydrogen was in excess. You need to go through those two processes. So let's say, assume that hydrogen is limiting and H2 is in excess. So then you then convert to say, OK, if I have 1.5 moles of H2, that ratio was a 2 to 2 ratio, so then I would end up with 1.5 moles of water. What if you have the reverse? What if O2 is limiting, re is limiting and H2 is in excess? So if I have the 0.9 moles of O2, what's the ratio of O to H2O? It's a 2 to 1 ratio. So I have 1.86 moles of water. So then you know then, because of that maximum yield, the lower number, which is the 1.51 for the yield from hydrogen, is the answer. That's the lower number. So that becomes then your limiting reagent. So how much oxygen and hydrogen remain when the reaction stops? So if H2 is the limiting reaction, it gets used up. There's none left. O2 is the excess reactant. There's extra. When it's all done, there's it's some left over. That's our large blue ball. That's some left over. So then we start with the limiting reagent. We know there's 1.5 moles of that. We then use its ratio to the excess reagent. Then we know how much was used. So for every 1.5 moles of oxygen we're going to use, 0.75 moles of, of the oxygen from the hydrogen. So then we subtract our starting amount, how much we were given, which was 0.9 moles, from how much we would use to know how many moles are left over, the excess. So here's an example. Calculate the mass of carbon that can be made from a combination of 15 grams of aluminum and 25 grams of copper sulfate. So we're going to go then with the 15 grams of aluminum to go to moles of aluminum, to go to moles of copper, to go to grams of copper. So we have those 25 grams copper to moles of copper sulfate to moles of copper to the grams of copper. So we need to do both of those to see which one is the limiting one. So then we're going to compare our answers and the smaller number is the right answer. So we do this, basically do the problem twice. We're doing a grams to moles, moles to moles, moles to grams reaction twice. So this is basically double the stoichiometry. So if we assume aluminum is the limiting reagent and copper sulfate is in excess, then we do that conversion. We go from grams of aluminum to moles of aluminum. We go from moles of aluminum to moles of copper, moles of copper to grams of copper to get us 53 grams. Then we do the reverse. We assume that copper sulfate is limiting. Calculate that. So if we have 25 grams of the copper sulfate, we go from grams of copper sulfate to moles of copper sulfate, moles of copper sulfate to moles of copper, and then moles of copper to grams of copper, and we have 9.96 grams. Compare the answers, and we know then that copper sulfate is a limiting reagent because it is the smaller number. So that's the theoretical yield. 
is the 9.6 grams of copper. So when you compare quantities of reactants, you, when you work with the limiting reagent problem, the reactants you have, the least of is the limiting reagent. No. So when you compare the quantities of the reactants, when you're working with the limiting reaction, the reactants you have, not necessarily the least of, not the amount, but the moles. So it's not the grams that you're concerned about. That's why this problem is false. You're not thinking about the gram comparison. You have to do the mole comparison. So it says the least of, so this least of is a gram comparison. You can't do that. To do limiting reagents, you have to do a mole comparison. So that's why this is false. It's the reactant you have the least moles of, not the least grams of. So if it doesn't say moles in that limiting reagent, then it's not correct. It's not necessarily the amount of the stuff you have. It's that ratio. It's that comparison between the moles of the two things. So which is the limiting reactant when you have three moles of copper that react with three moles of silver nitrate in the following? So our plan then is when you have moles of copper to the compare that to moles of silver nitrate. Okay. So, when we go through and look at this then, we say, well, we have, if we have three moles of copper, then how is that compared to the moles of of how much we need of silver nitrate. So we know that that comparison then is the relationship from our balanced equation. So we know for every one mole of copper, we're then going to need two moles of the silver nitrate. So we know then that where that is going to be then six is our ratio there. Because if we have a one to two ratio, if we have three moles, we're going to end up with six moles of the silver nitrate. So if we start off with the other one, we say, well, what if we had three moles of silver nitrate? So we have three moles of silver nitrate. What's that ratio? So once again, if we then use the balanced equation for every two moles of silver nitrate, we then have one of copper. So we have then three halves, which is one and a half of copper. So then we know then that the silver nitrate is going to limit it. So if we have three moles, because this is a lower number, when we make that comparison. So if we have three moles of each, we need, we need six moles of the silver. We don't have it. We only have three. If we have three moles of the silver, we only need a mole, a mole and a half of copper. And we have three, so we have plenty. So we know if we have three moles of each, then the silver is going to limit us. Because we don't have enough. If we have three moles of copper, we need six moles of silver. We don't have six moles. We only have three. So that tells us that that can't be true. If we have three moles of silver, then we only need a mole and a half. But we have three, which is plenty. So that's going to be the limiting reagent.
So what's the mass of silver produced by reacting three moles of copper with three moles of copper sulf, copper nitrate? So when you have that, re that reaction occurs, then we need to plan that conversion. So what's the mass? So we're going from, once again, going to make that comparison. So if we have the three moles of copper, then how many moles of copper nitrate, then silver nitrate do we need? Well, we need six, because a, a one to two ratio is a three to six ratio. So we know then that the three moles of copper nitrate is going to then be the limiting reagent. So we can start with that. So when we start with that, I need to pause for a second here. We're back. Okay. So, so we have the uh, three moles of the silver nitrate. <coughs> and then we know from our balanced equation that for every two moles of silver nitrate, we're going to produce two moles of silver. And then we know that for every one mole of silver, it's going to weigh 107.87 grams. So we know that if we have three moles of this, that will cancel. You know, we have two moles. We have the moles, the moles. So you have the three times two, and you can basically cancel these out as well if you want to. Uh, three times the 107. So that's approximately 324, most likely. Okay. Percent yield. So this kind of takes this to the next step of if you have a efficiency, how much do you determine, how much do you create from the theoretical yield to the actual yield? How efficient is your chemical process? So you have the percent yield is the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield. The theoretical yield is the most you can make. So this is the most that you can possibly make. This is what you actually make. So then you're determining how efficient you are. The more you make compared to your uh, actual, the more efficient it is. The more close you are to what can possibly happen. So theoretical yield is calculated using the stoichiometry. The actual yield of the chemical reaction is experimental. You go into the lab and you make this stuff, and then you have experimental losses and errors, and that determines your percent yield. So what's the percent of PCL3 that results from a reaction of 5 grams of phosphorus with excess amount of chlorine if only 17.2 grams of that were recovered? So you first compute then how much should you have been able to make? What's the ideal? So you take that five grams and then do that process. You convert the five grams to the moles. So we're going to go from, in this case, grams to moles. Then we're going to go from moles to moles using the balanced equation. And then we're going to go from moles to grams. 
like we did in stoichiometry. So grams cancel, moles cancel, moles of PCL cancels, and then you have grams over. So this is the most you can make. If everything was perfect, that will be the most you could make. Since you didn't make that much, what kind of percent yield did you make? So now we do the percent yield. We take what you actually made, 17.2, divided by what you could have made, the most you could have made, and that's your percent yield. So this is a 77% yield. All right, so now we have a reaction that occurs, producing ammonia. The theoretical yield of, of 420 grams. What's the percent yield if the actual yield is 350? So we take how much we actually made, 350, divided by how much we could have made, 420 times 100 equals our amount. And it's always less than 100. Can't make more than you could have made. And 300 out of 400 is relatively high, so I'm going to go with the 83. So here's an example of putting it all together. This is where all these pieces come together. If given this problem, when limestone calcium carbonate is reacted with hydrochloric acid, the products are calcium chloride, water, and carbon dioxide. Do all the parts. So here we go. So the first step then is to write your balanced equation. You have the calcium carbonate. You look up. We know calcium, we know carbonate, we know that the uh, um, calcium is going to be a plus, we know this is a minus 2, plus 2, we know this is a plus 1, minus 1, we know this is a minus 1 and a plus 2, and then we know that that is uh, creating that process over here with a minus 2, um, so you have a plus 4. We have the water. We can balance it. So that's our balanced reaction. So we can make that calcium carbonate, calcium chloride, water, and carbon dioxide. So you can write that out and balance it. All right, now that we know that that's a balanced reaction, we then can say, well, what's the mass of calcium carbonate is going to be consumed when 20 grams of that reacts completely? So we have our plan. We're going to go from grams of hydrochloric acid to moles of hydrochloric acid to moles of calcium carbonate to grams of calcium carbonate. So that's the plan that we need to follow. then we can calculate that 27.5 grams will be consumed by following those steps. When limestone is reacted, what mass of calcium carbonate will be produced when 20 grams of hydrochloric acid reacts completely? We go through that same process. You know we're starting out with our grams of hydrochloric acid. We want to go to moles of hydrochloric acid, and we want to go to moles of carbon dioxide, and then we want to go to grams of carbon dioxide. And that's going to be 12.1 grams of carbon dioxide are produced when you go through that process, starting with 20 grams. And 
And these are the problems. Thank you.